thought I should put up the um, diagram of the, <coughs> the dreaded seven layers, which um, I guess the younger ones might not recognize what the colors are here either. So who recognizes why the colors are as they are? <laughs> yeah. No, you could do an entire talk just on that. Um, <clears throat> what, yeah, what I want to talk about is Econet, Cambridge Ring and Multilink. And this actually, it all began when I went to a couple of talks at uh, what's now Anglia Ruskin. It was then uh, CCAT, the Technical College. Um, <clears throat> on a course that was organised by Clive Sinclair, but not that Clive Sinclair, very confusingly. <laughs> And uh, yeah, there, were a couple, there was a talk about Echinet and there was a talk about Cambridge Ring. At that time, we'd been doing contract software, uh, including for the other Clive Sinclair. And the problem with contract software is you kind of have to promise at the beginning of the project how long it's going to take. And you always get that wrong. Um, and we were thinking, yeah, well, you know, Clive's built these computers, you know, you know what it's going to cost you to build it. Um, and so that makes it much, it makes it uh, kind of a bit more comfortable. And having been to those two talks, I thought, yeah, there's good stuff in both of them, but you could take good bits out of each and make something rather different, which you could put in a box and sell. Um, so we did. Back in those days, how you actually got the bits down the wire was really quite crude compared with now. You just had uh, high and low and your receiver was simply looking at the analog signal, finding whether it was above or below a threshold uh, and giving you a digital output. There was no, nothing clever in there the way that there is now. But of course, when the signal's coming down the wire, you've got the bits coming one at a time. You've got to know when to sample them. And actually, we'd all taken different views on that. Um, so on Econet, they had two wires. One carried the clock and one carried the signal. So every time the clock ticked, you read the signal. Um, uh, but the problem that they had um, was that they were a bit cavalier about just what the wire looked like. Um, and uh, this works fine until your clock signal is being reflected off the other end of the wire. And instead of going like that, it goes like that. And maybe you read it twice and you think there are two bits when there was actually one. Um, however, it was all on their interface. They were taking a standard chip that did ADLC. Um, um, and I think that chip uh, was probably uh, tasked with uh, coping with, with ringing on the clock and so on. Um, and on the other side of that chip, they were just using their CPU clock. So the CPU was told, hey, we've got another byte. Uh, and it would then come read it. So they weren't, they weren't having to, they weren't having a problem of having to synchronize the two clocks. Um, Cambridge Ring, on the other hand, very much was synchronizing clocks. They still had two wires, um, and I think it was a, a one was a change in one wire and a zero was a change in both wires or the other way around. Uh, that meant that each wire was changing fairly often, um, which kind of helps with in, in a way that I really can't, haven't time to go into. Yeah, it meant that you had to be, you had to have a local clock that was doing the reading and you had to adjust that clock so that, um, so that the edges on the wire were coming in the right place. Um, and they seemed to be, sourcing that clock from one place on the ring uh, and then the next one on the ring would uh, be synchronizing its clock to that and the next one synchronizes to this one and I'm quite amazed it worked at all. Now in our case uh, we were doing it just like RS232 
which is the standard then for um, serial data. And you know everything had one of these interfaces. And you had a clock that ran rather faster. So the, uh, the little arrows are the clock ticks. And the format is that it's in the one state while there's nothing going on. The beginning of any character uh, is a zero. Uh, so that edge from the, that falling edge tells you when the bit cell starts. Um, and you then count the number of clocks that's half a bit cell and you sample there. Uh, and you then count a whole bit cell and sample again and so on. So those longer arrows are the ones where you sample. And uh, now, <coughs> this was originally specified for things like teletypes, which are mechanical things that, uh, you know, you press a key on your teletype and a thing rotates. And uh, it, it was entirely mechanical. And <coughs> the speed at which it rotated, you couldn't get super accurate. Um, it was within about 3%. So, the one that's sampling might be sampling in the wrong place. Well, the, if you like, the little arrows might be a bit closer together or a bit further apart compared to the signal. Um, and so in RS-232, you can have about 11 bits, after which you might just not be sampling in the right place. Um, in our case, though, we had a crystal clock, which, uh, you know, without any doing anything fancy you get um, 100 parts per million so 0.01 percent so the sender might be 0.01 percent fast and the receiver 0.01 percent slow but you can still go 760 bits before you're getting too far from the sampling point so that's what we did and that was why we had a, um, a packet size of that length. E Econet <coughs> You just connected everything together and originally you did just connect it all together in any way you wanted. Uh, then I think they started wanting to run it a bit faster. So they started having to do a bit more carefully and eventually they had a wire with proper termination at each end. Now if you're doing that obviously um, if some of the things connected are switched off that's not a problem provided whatever's connected doesn't sort of collapse to zero and cause a short circuit. Um, if the cable actually breaks, then well, firstly, you've split the network into two. Um, secondly, the unterminated ends where the break is might cause uh, reflections. But um, it's sort of reasonably robust from that point of view. The other two are rings. The great thing about a ring is each piece of wire only has two ends. Uh, so that made that aspect of it rather easier. So you've got um, so here's your cable and it goes into one of the things that are connected and the electronics forwards the signal and it can mess around with the signal as it forwards it. Um, and that forwards it onto the next one and so on around the ring. Now, um, your issue there obviously is if that piece of electronics is turned off, uh, then you do have kind of a problem. And <coughs> Cambridge Ring's answer to that was that they had they actually powered it through the ring. So the, the ring gave the power to your interface. Um, and you had to have a special box somewhere that actually had, had the power coming in. Um, now in our case, um, we did it rather differently. We put a relay on each of the interfaces and uh, I've got one here. Uh, so the, there is the, the cable that we plugged into the wall 
and there is the relay that if the power is off the relay simply connects the ring input connects the input directly to the output and there's the box that that's on the wall and inside it uh, it took us some time to actually work out what was a good way of connecting things but eventually we discovered this magic thing called the post office type 420 in here again there are jumpers there so when there's nothing plugged in the input just goes straight across to the output when that's plugged in uh, it's now going down the wire and through the relay and that does mean that you can just obviously as you are as you're plugging something in there's a bit of disturbance on the ring but it's quite quick and no one really notices uh, and of course in these days when you if you're sending live audio or something you'd hear a click but in those days um, nothing was fast enough to send live audio layer two is media access control which is how you how you control the way that different things, how you control who can speak. Um, you know, when there's a group of people around the table, there, there are all kinds of cues we have that uh, help, <clears throat> help you know when, when to talk and when to listen. And Econet having a broadcast medium where everything transmits onto the same medium, that again is very much like people around a table. Um, if they all talk at once, nobody can understand any of it. Um, and so there's protocol there to decide who's going to speak. On a ring, it's rather different because you have the one piece, you, you have at, at each point on the, at each node, um, you've got the signal coming in, the signal going out, and you can do stuff with it locally. Um, Cambridge ring is what's called a slotted ring. Um, the, basically the ring is formatted into these what are called slots. Um, I've picked that up out of um, um, and, and out of the MathLab documentation for it, which shows what a slot looks like. And um, again, without going into the detail of it, um, as a slot comes in, if it's empty, you can put your fr your frame your pack it into it um, and uh, there's a whole lot of protocol there but it's it's all quite straightforward at each point so there isn't the possibility of three things all talking at once. Now in our case we did something rather different um, we had technology that's called buffer insertion which made it all much more um, informal and the way the buffer insertion works, whereas Cambridge ring inside the node, they just have um, pretty much as each bit goes past, you can change it. Um, in our case, uh, the way the inside of the node looks, um, there is a buffer, sort of, I shall draw like that, and what you transmit on can come either from the buffer or directly from what's on the wire. Um, when you want to transmit, um, you, when, you, when you transmit, what's coming in then goes into the buffer. So you've got your packet here that you're transmitting. So you, uh, you have to wait for a gap between packets but then you switch and you transmit your packet while you're transmitting what comes in goes into this buffer, this other buffer. When your packet's finished, you then send on the stuff from the buffer. And of course there will be idle times there. And at the very least, your packet eventually will come right back round the ring if nothing else has taken it off. Um, and once you've caught up and that's empty, then you switch back to that mode and at that point you were allowed to send another packet. So unlike the, um, in Cambridge Ring they had a monitor station um, which did things like tidying away any um, uh, packets that had 
that something's put a packet on the ring and for some reason it hasn't taken it off again. So to stop it going round and round forever, um, there's a whole lot of administration that that does. Whereas in our case, we didn't need that. It was all very, um, as, as one might say, um, you, know, you, you didn't have anyone in charge. Okay, something else that I need to put in at some point is that we have two ways that communication can happen which we call connection-oriented and connectionless. And connection-oriented is like the phone box. Uh, you want to speak to someone, and so you go to the phone box, you dial the number, or you talk to the operator, and the operator puts plugs in, and then you can talk to the person at the other end. The system doesn't really need to know who you're talking to once it's made the connection. You know, the connection is just, you, you've got a in, in, in those days, you just had uh, your piece of copper from one end to the other. Um, and you talk, and then at some point when you've finished, you, you disconnect. Uh, connectionless is much more like the post box. So, you know, you can have a conversation. Uh, pe people uh, play, play chess games by sending each other a postcard with the move on it. Um, and whereas if you phone someone up and you say pawn to king four and they say pawn to queen three and, and so on, you, you're, you just had to dial at the beginning. If you're doing it uh, with postcards, then you've got to put their name and address on every postcard for every move. And that's the, the, the main difference. And there have always been religious wars about this. Um, telecoms people understand connection oriented. Uh, because it's the way the telephone network works and uh, you know, really before computers came along there, were, there was a worldwide system with perhaps not quite billions connected at that stage um, but uh, it worked. Um, the IT folks think everything has to be connectionless and although that works well locally it doesn't work so well globally and the more you look at it, the more you work out that actually everything is part of a conversation. Um, <clears throat> again, I won't go into the detail of what all these acronyms are, but basically they are all um, <clears throat> conversations with a particular entity at the other end. So <clears throat> that's how the network works. Then, of course, to actually be useful, it has to connect to something. Cambridge Ring and Econet in both cases, the node was um, part of the computer, it sort of plugged into the computer. And the computer was doing quite a bit of the work of uh, communication. So the computer was doing all the higher layers. Whereas in our case, the, the original idea was that this would do for uh, serial interfaces what telephones do for people. The way that it worked was very much session layer. But gradually we started um, having interfaces for computers, there's a whole lot of them on the table there. Uh, we finished up with five ways of, of talking to it. So you had your single channel for the serial interface and there was one mode where the thing the other end was a VDU and there was another mode for where it was some something as what we called it dumb like a printer. Um, <coughs> And uh, when, when you switched on, it came up with a line that said type of backspace on the ex expectation that if there was a human there, they'd do that. And then you go into VDU mode. Um, and if there wasn't a human there, then they wouldn't. Uh, and you stayed in a mode where the, the VDU mode gave you lots of information that we still don't get on current networks. Uh, with the dumb mode, obviously, uh, you've just got the data. But then we started going to things that were much more uh, like a packet network, but still uh, with things being routed according to channels. So you connect it a channel, and then you could send packets on that channel. And you could have you know, <coughs> several dozen channels connected to different things, and you could send packets to all of them. Um, <coughs> but you still didn't have to put the full address on everything. Econet had, the header was 16 bits saying where it was going, 16 bits saying where it's come from. Because of course, in a shared media network, you've got to say who it's going to. And then you had a, a reasonable sized chunk of data because 
um, the way they did it, you said, I want to send to him. Um, and everyone else would, as soon as you knew everyone else had got that message and they so they weren't going to say anything, uh, you could then send and you could send a, uh, send until the end of your message. Whereas with Cambridge Ring, you only got 16 bits of data. So you had to send multiple packets and the thing the other end had to reassemble them. Um, in Multilink, we still had a uh, destination because you know something comes in. What I didn't sort of include on that diagram was that there was another buffer that stuff comes into. Um, so there's another buffer here that, that gets a copy of what comes in. And uh, when something's, when we're at the start of a packet, the processor gets an interrupt. It looks in there, says, is this for me? If it is, it starts taking an interest. If it isn't, uh, it just goes away. It goes off and does other things uh, until it gets another interrupt. And so you had to have a very simple test. Is this something I'm interested in? Which was the, the destination. And the coding was such that the first bit was always zero, as we had to have for the RS232-like format. Then you had a forwarding count, which every time something's gone through one of those buffers, it gets decremented. Uh, so that's a kind of time to live. Then we had the length, and I really can't remember why we needed the length, because we had an all ones byte at the end that showed, that showed where the end of the packet was. Um, I think it was something to do with the buffer management. And we had a checksum for the whole packet because I hadn't learned by then that you're supposed to protect the header. The header should have its own checksum to make sure you're not misrouting things. But then uh, checking the payload should be for the higher layers. And the checksums in the middle, which shows that we assembled these packets in a buffer and then sent them. Whereas these days you tend to calculate things like checksums on the fly as they're going out. But uh, that needed logic, which was expensive then. And, it, and also you had the sender, which again, I think I did that because we thought, you know, everyone else did. Um, I now wouldn't put the sender there. Um, in a control packet, I would put the sender as part of the payload. And in a data packet, you just have the channel number because that's all you need. There's a quite an elaborate process because having said that we don't have any kind of controller, we do, uh, when you first switch something on, it's not acquired an address. So it has address zero. So if you send a packet to address zero, um, that will get to the first thing that's on the ring that hasn't got an address yet. Um, and uh, yeah, we had a, there's a quite a, an, a protocol that had to cope with, uh, it had to cope with two or three things turning up at once. It had to cope with the entire system being on a circuit breaker and someone turns the power on and they all come up almost at once. Not quite at once, of course, which is how we managed to, to get away with that. So, as I said, we were connection oriented. Um, each node, you can have up to 254 channels, which just means there's an 8-bit field for the channel and a couple of the code points are special. So you send out a control packet, which is a, um, a call packet. You're saying, I want to make a connection on channel such and such. And there were a whole different, lot of different ways that you could say what you wanted to talk to. Um, you could give its name. You could say how far around the ring it was. You could say, I want to talk to the third one on from here, which if you were a, a VDU was quite handy because there was a command that listed everything that was on the ring, listed their names, and you say, oh yeah, that one. And uh, that, that uses that uh, time to live field. Pretty much the one thing you didn't do was set, was specifying the node num, the uh, that seven bit address, uh, because that was inside the ring and it was something that users shouldn't have to know about, um, unlike current networks. Then you get a reply that says, "Yes, I've, I'm accepting that call on your channel 17. 
and it's my channel 32 after which anything being sent on channel 17 at that end just gets addressed to that node it's channel 32 that's all you need to put in your routing table so that's um, again back in those days memory was a bit scarce and uh, so keep, keeping things simple was was useful the call packets look different from data packets which i guess means it's out of band signaling but on the host interface it's in band so if you have a um, you've got a channel that's not connected the connection request just looks like data on that channel and that was quite handy because having talked a lot about a ring you don't necessarily want to have everything on one ring so here you've got uh, a ring with um, a whole lot of machines in one place uh, or rather several machines and this node perhaps is connected to another ring somewhere else um, so uh, in our case we had a ring where we did development there was another ring in production um, <clears throat> another ring for uh, the, 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 the administration so you had um, <clears throat> and this is just a normal node with the two host interfaces connected back to back so here you're going to a PC or something um, here you've just got a back to back connection um, and uh, you could have serial connections that were sort of pretty much fast enough um, much the same speed as the ring so this PC makes a connection to uh, to this gateway um, so it says I want to talk to the Gate, hang on, it's on the next slide, sorry. So this gateway is called Ring 2, um, presumably because it gives them, uh, gives you access to Ring 2, and on here you have PC5. Um, so it says I want to connect to, to Ring 2. Um, sorry, I should have said that in PCs, uh, we had some software called SimpleNet, um, in which um, it hooked the the uh, interface to the filing system and you could set up a drive so in that case I've set up drive X as being the network um, and you say and so you're asking your application is asking to open that um, that um, file path um, and what the the software hooks that request, it intercepts that request because it's for drive X um, and it makes a connection to ring 2 and the network says yeah you're connected to ring 2 and then it sends out on that same channel I want to connect to PC5 um, and that goes over this ring as data uh, this one sees it as a connection request so it again makes a connection to PC5 it comes back saying yeah uh, and in, didn't do this in multi-link but superlink the later one it came back saying yeah this is um, this is a PC um, but anyway it then asks for the, in the PC there are different services so you can do sort of telnet and that kind of thing um, and one of them was the file server so the next part of it it says I want a connection to that and the PC the SimpleNet software in here um, again uses the same protocol and says yeah you're connected to that and this is a file server and this says oh it's a file server and takes the rest of the path and says open and again the file server commands were delightfully simple um, <clears throat> 
So you had, I think, oh, there we are, an 8-bit tag and a couple of bytes that were the data length. So there's a tag for open uh, length of the path and it gives it the path. Um, and you could do things like specifying a username and a password. And of course, once you've specified the password, that's there and for as long as the connection lasts. Um, and if someone tries to intercept it somewhere along here, of course, the connection drops when they unplug something. And the, the competition there was a thing called network filing system, which was very much the, the letterbox idea. And it would put all the information in every request and every request um, hadn't, did, wasn't allowed to depend on anything else that was going on. Okay, that's the format of the data packets, which uh, again, I think I need to be moving on. So that was Multilink, where we started off doing serial boxes. We then had um, a request for a company that was making things that had Intel Multibus. They didn't have a spare serial interface, so they said, we're going to have to build a card that size, because uh, that's what Multibus cards are, um, with a serial interface on to connect to the box. And I said, well, hey, let's put all the circuitry in there. And down here somewhere um, are a couple of chips which to both sides look like the registers in a serial interface chip. Uh, we then put that into a Ferranti ULA because we've been introduced to Ferranti by Clive. Um, so... Um, and uh, yeah, it's in ceramic because it gets jolly hot. Um, and then, yeah, we then went on to Superlink, which was a new um, ASIC gate array. Uh, this square fella here, which then was in plastic because it's in CMOS, uh, so it didn't get so hot. The Ferranti one is. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the um, technologies that gets hot. And then, whereas previously we'd had that many chips uh, in the box because, um, yeah, I'd reckoned if, <clears throat> if we could build it with no more chips than there were in a ZX80, that would be fine, and we could. Uh, and then rather like the ZX81, we went to, to having the chip set. And... <clears throat> Uh, once we got the chipset, we were then doing interfaces for other things. That one's an apricot. Um, again, the and, and that's that's the IBM PC one. Uh, again, it all looks kind of like a serial interface to the PC, but of course, you've then got the uh, SwiftLink driver soft. Uh, sorry, the SimpleNet software that. Um, conceals that from the from the, the upper layers. Uh, so yeah, Superlink, we had this CMOS one that was square and plastic. Um, and then the serial box became just four chips. Uh, and you could use it as, as parallel as well. SwiftLink was just uh, <coughs> adding some extra protocols uh, to, to make the remote file access um, more efficient. Then in the 1990s, we come on to an, another technology uh, appeared, uh, which was called ATM, which had a, um, a bit of a fight with Ethernet and lost. And one of the ancestors of that was Cambridge Fast Ring, the uh, Cambridge Ring guys, you know, in the same way that we'd that we'd updated um, Multilink, going six times as fast, they updated theirs to go ten times as fast. Uh, they were using similar sized slots, which meant they could get thirty-two bytes of data, and they were using the same coding as the, as as before. There was then a, a big meeting in nineteen eighty-nine, at which ATM. The, the basics of ATM were decided. The Europeans wanted 32 bytes, the Americans wanted 64, so they decided on 48. 
which actually I found quite nice because you could have a 64 byte buffer and you have 48 bytes of data and 16 bytes to, for the other stuff that you needed. Slightly more elaborate coding, which means that really it means you can put it through transformers easily because there is no DC component. There was a weird thing called DQDB, which is sort of like the slotted ring but unfolded. And apart from that, it was star connected switches. So where previously you'd had a ring, all that happened inside a box. Now the way that ATM addressing was done, you had a channel number in the cell header. This, a lot of that came from the way that telecom people thought, because in uh, SDH you have fixed, fixed bit rate channels. Um, the idea of ATM was that you no longer had to have fixed bit rate, uh, and that meant that you had to have something that told you which channel each lump of data was intended for. So it was basically connection oriented. Um, and there's an ITU standard called Q.2931, which you can download from Tinterweb. They missed out on some of the benefits. In particular, it had fixed format addresses. Uh, you know, whereas in Multilink, you, you could ask for a, a, a name, which could be any length. They still had this idea that, you know, <clears throat> addresses almost as they would have been in packet headers. And so they missed being able to have <coughs> rather more options for saying how you talk to things. And uh, whereas in our case, in, in SimpleNet, you could tell the file server at the other end your name and, and password and so on. In this case, there wasn't anything like that. If you could get onto the network, you could make connections anywhere, a bit like the way the internet is now. And uh, there was not nearly enough in the signaling messages to tell the thing the other end what you actually wanted to talk about. So ATM came in at 100 megabits at a time when a PC could barely use 10 megabits. Um, 100 megabits and there were, I think I worked out at the time, about 50 million PCs in the world. Um, <coughs> And there were about half a million big workstations which actually could use 100 megabits. So, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea to make some reason that people needed 100 megabits into a PC? So, um, uh, we um, had this concept product which took the video and put it into a video in a window card, which was made by a company down in Royston. And from that, we then moved on um, actually, we never took that into production because what went into production was boxes rather like this, but with video instead of the serial port. Then we're getting onto the 2000s, a project with the BBC to implement the Radio 4 broadcast chain over ATM, which they decided on pretty much as ATM was dying, which is a bit of a shame. But what made it interesting was that they couldn't get the switch they wanted to use. Uh, and they said, uh, oh, could you build a, an ATM switch? And uh, I said, oh, yeah, that would be interesting. Let's do that. So we did. And I found out afterwards that everyone else had built switches in a much more, they made it much more complex than it needed to be. Yeah, we had just the two services, whereas the ATM standard said you needed two other services, which actually I didn't think you did. By having a, a somewhat different service for the, for the two, you could do each of them rather more simply. Yeah, so during that project, project they said, uh, oh, well, we want the ATM over copper standard. And I said, you do realise there's only one chip you can get that does it, and it's horrible. Um, and why don't we go for gigabit Ethernet as the physical layer? Because these guys... Um, as you can see there, it's cheaper and easier and even has less latency. Um, and in doing that, you can avoid the problems in ATM. You find you don't need a fixed cell size because we can now put a bit more complexity into the, into the uh, interface um, because logic is becoming really cheap. This little fella here has got is a 
Spartan 6 that's got um, thousands of those little chips in, or rather it uh, has the same amount of logic as several thousand of those uh, little black things. Another of the problems with ATM was that they didn't do it in a way that would let you plug your PC into it. Um, again, there's a, there's a story attached to that as well, which is quite long and rather sad. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I prototyped it with uh, one of these fellas. Uh, we had some uh, network ports and some uh, audio ports there and there, and you could do either network or video through these fellas. And the format on the link, we had two streams multiplexed together because what we'd found in the BBC project was that was all you needed. You needed a, uh, what in the jargon is called constant bitrate service. Um, the kind of thing you have with audio and video, you know, if you're having professional audio, uh, 24 or 32 bits every 48th of a millisecond. Uh, and once you start sending, that's what you're sending and that's what the other end needs to receive. So we have a service for that, similarly for, uh, I mean, video has the same requirement. And then we have a service for the IT stuff. Uh, and the service for the IT stuff, we could have much bigger packets. Uh, we first thought we could have packets of any size. Uh, so, yeah, that we could make allocations for these services at any size, but then we quickly found that there was a minimum slot size because when it gets into the switch, it's then going to go into a shared memory. Uh, and that memory has to be quite wide to keep up with all these uh, gigabit ports. And you couldn't really have less than that as your slot size. If you have big blocks of them for a long packet, then you can't you, you, you can't then allocate other flows on that port. Um, and so we finished up with 64 bytes was uh, pretty much the minimum and really conveniently it was about the maximum. Uh, routing is connection oriented. It is very much like ATM, but signaling is an IEC standard which we kind of slipped into one that was supposed to be an audio standard. And uh, yeah, so we're routing flows very much like multi-link channels. And all you have in the header, packet header of the IT ones, is the flow label, which is like the multi-link channel number. And of course you need the length because they're variable length. Uh, and we don't have a reserved symbol for end of packet. And uh, if you're using Berkeley sockets in your software, the flow label is just like a socket handle, so it's, it fits really neatly with, with that paradigm. Uh, yeah, we give you multiple ways to identify what you want to talk to, and we give you security features and so on. So the constant bitrate service, you realise that if you're going to allocate sp uh, space in the frame, then you don't need to identify the flow because you know which flow it is. Um, and we've got a, quite a neat way of doing the forwarding, which again, uh, I think I need to skip over. Yeah, so with the IT packets, uh, as I said, all you have is the, the length and the label. Um, the label's an index into the routing table, so it, the routing table in the switch says, um, okay, this has come in as label so-and-so on that port. Uh, that tells you exactly where to look in the routing table. There you are. So, layer one started off as being simple binary. We then went to 4B, 5B. And now there's all this complex multi-level stuff that you get inside an Ethernet phi and don't need to understand because um, Ethernet people have done all the difficult stuff. <coughs> We've gone from shared media, well, apart from Wi-Fi, which I guess is still shared media. Um, on that slide at the beginning, I talked about Wi-Fi, which was shared media rather like Econet. And 
IP which was rooted kind of the way that Cambridge Ring is and uh, and I mentioned mobile where although it's radio so that's that's a shared medium the radio uh, on the radio channel is very much point to point between the tower and the handset in today's network that ring there would be a box like the aubergine box with a number of ports so you would have um, you have a box and your PC comes into one of the ports uh, and that connection comes off another one <coughs> so what goes on inside a switch is very much what used to go on in the rings um, but uh, of course the uh, the whole way you share the way you share what the uh, the capacity of it is different um, nevertheless and, and so you know it's <coughs> Whereas it, instead of waiting for permission to transmit here, uh, in here it's your packet has gone into a queue and uh, is waiting for all the ones ahead of it in the queue. So there is still the same kind of things happen in a switch as, as, as happened on, on, on a, a, a ring. Um, we had Minimal interface logic, I mean each of those little black things, I think there's about 20 of them and they tend to be you know, four NAND gates or whatever. Uh, now you've got a few thousand in those little tiny FPGAs, more in bigger ones. So you can do much more useful stuff without getting a CPU in the way. Which is actually jolly useful because if you look at the rate that CPU speeds have increased. Um, they've really stopped increasing at all recently, or hardly, uh, whereas link speeds are going up and up. And so there is more stuff coming in than a CPU can deal with. And of course, originally we could only move data, whereas now there's enough capacity to take things like audio and video. So that's it. Please run